Welcome to Legends Live, presented by the National Basketball Retired Players Association, the official home of NBA and WNBA legends. We have another chat with Gat for you today with NBA legend, former NBA coach, and our NBA alumni vice president, Kenny Gaddison, is here. And today he'll be having a conversation with Mo Evans. Now, Mo was an 11-year NBA legend. He was also the former vice president of the Players Association, and he was integral in the lockout negotiations from 2011. Um, he's currently an entrepreneur and a startup investor, and he also played in the big three. But joining Kenny today, we have Mo of Evans. Welcome to Legends Live. Thank you for having me. I look forward to the conversation. Thanks for the intro. Hey, Mo, how you doing, brother? How's everything going? Man, for as uh, as, good, as good as it can go for everything that's going on in our uh, you know global climate. With um, obviously, we have some challenges with uh, the death of of George Floyd. He's a Houstonian, and I'm here in Houston, so right. obviously we're dealing with a lot of that uh, unrest. And then amid the COVID nineteen, I'm sure that everybody's uh, feeling some of the the challenges from that, you know, um, you know, people getting sick and some people not having made it through it. Obviously, a lot of businesses are suffering. Uh, sports, who whoever would have thought that sports would, would would just go silent like it has. So, uh, trying to make sense of all of that. But how are you holding up, bro? I'm doing good, man. I'm, you know, still under house arrest, trying to be safe, and you know, it's it's you have to trust the science over the politicians in this and you know of, of course everything is such i mean 20 2020 is going to go down as a year unlike anything we've ever seen and now that you've kind of touched on the, the the political climate the social climate and everything let's let's just start off with that since you 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 started with that and Let's just talk a little bit about um, your perspective on the movement, you know, and, and I call it a movement now because it's taken a breath. It's, it's, it's taken a life of its own, and this is not minor stuff. This is, this is unlike anything this country has ever seen other than the 60s with the with the civil rights movement and and, and martin luther king and, and what he was doing as a as a younger retired player how do you see this change in in, in society and how do you see it impacting this country and especially for the millennials going for and the millennial kids what what good would you like to see come out of this yeah i mean i think that's a, a great question and you know again i'm glad to have an opportunity to um to 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 first of all to um to have lived long enough to appreciate the 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 past and meaning things that a lot of our forefathers have um have accomplished to even allow us as a African American race to um, to have the opportunities that we have, and as we know, and as as has been demonstrated now, we have a very very long way to go. Um, I listened to Stephen Jackson, one of our other uh, legends and and brothers in the fraternity, um, you know, speak out, and he kind of spoke more from his uh, an emotional for, uh, standpoint. He spoke about the anger that he had for the officer, and if he had thirty minutes alone with them and things of that nature. And I wish that. Um, he would have taken a little bit of time to kind of speak out on some of the other issues as well, which what you just asked me, which is, you know, Colin Kaepernick tried to bring some, some, um, shed some light on this four years ago. And yet not many people took that, that bold stance. There's been so many uh, uh, individuals who have lost their lives that are, are, that we know their name and the, the 16 individuals that, you know, we all speak about, but however, is so many other faceless individuals who um, who haven't um, been able to be celebrated in the same way that George Floyd is. You know, I look at the fact that, you know, you think back to the Emmett Tills and you think back to all of the other 
people in history who have been assassinated, who have lost their lives. And it's like, you know, until we truly get to the heart of the issue, which is the systemic racism is one thing, but it's another thing to, to actually attack the core issues, which is, you know, how to break out of the system and how the system that is oppressing our people and oppressing minorities um, at, at large, such as the, the addressing the 13th Amendment. You know, the 13th Amendment, it says that, you know, slavery shall not exist in these here United States unless you get incarcerated. Many of our African-Americans, we get caught up in the system, whether it's through nonviolent offenses and, you know, you get um, a traffic ticket that you can't pay, hypothetically. Now, all of a sudden, you can't pay and you get your, your, your license suspended. And then you end up driving a suspended license. Guess what? You get locked up, get on probation, you can't get a job. Now, all of a sudden, that little cycle, you're in the system. I think that it's things like that that we have to start being aware of is, is if we're not able to um, identify what oppresses us, we won't be able to ever create change. Right, and, and, and I think what, what, what's happened over the course of the years, and I'm a little bit older than you, and I was, you know, I was, I was born in 1964, right in here in North Carolina in the South, and not only did I see it, I lived it, you know, and I've discussed this with with a few other of the, the guests we've had on here. And 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 I would say the biggest thing, Mo, that is helping, aiding, and supporting our cause as, as African Americans and people of color in this country. For a hundred years, we've been crying about police brutality and, and, and injustice. And nobody listened because out of sight, out of mind. Oh, uh, it can't be that bad. They 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 not treated that bad. But now with technology, you got a video on your cell phone that you can send to any media outlet in the world. And now this is this is the pink elephant that's finally been slammed on the table when it can't be ignored. When you go back to the the civil rights movements of the 60s, 70s, and, and the thing that our leaders endured, the, the water hoses, the, the, the dogs being put on them, being physically beaten with batons. You know, we're gonna beat you back in your place. That no longer can be tolerated. That That can't be interpreted any other way now because you have a video feed almost in real time of what's been going on and it's interesting that you bring up cap to this point and how ironic it, it is that all that man did was was take a knee to bring attention and it cost him his career and his livelihood and you know i've, I've been looking and listening to a lot of things and and you know where where nfl players have really bonded the nfl in itself has come together and so now they support his play you know if if they were supported cap four years ago maybe george floyd would have never happened maybe somebody would have would have taken notice and said okay this is a lot more serious so you know j just like you said this it's been a crazy year and uh but at least at least now people are having the conversations yeah they're hard conversations they're tough conversations but it's harder and tougher being an african-american a person of color in these united states of america so hopefully that you know instead of just talking about it and the dialogue has been great and i hope the tsunami keeps going but until you address the root causes you're not going to get come with the solutions. And the first thing that has to happen is there has to be a change in the, in the prosecution of, of law enforcement officers. And now what you're seeing is a, a popery of, of videos that's coming up that African-American people have been killed saying they can't breathe things that's happened three, four, five, six months ago, two, three years ago. And 
I'm glad it's all coming. I think it's it's the best, what's best for our country. It's what's best for our nation moving forward. And no, everybody's not going to get on the same page at the same time, but at least the conversation's being had. No, I would agree. And, you know, just to add one more thing uh, before we transition, you know, I think that this is it's very important to recognize, especially for us as as former players and current players recognize the responsibility that we have. And that's something that I do applaud Colin Kaepernick for is that he took a stand with the platform that we were given and something that's challenging for many of us is just to understand that it's like, you know, for the NBA alone, 450 players are paid more than $3 billion, you know, in six months. And it's like, what are we going to do with those dollars to actually help individuals empower our communities, you know, and, and, and make life better and infuse businesses and, and do things to move things forward, you know? So right. I'm going to move, I'm going to move around a little bit because the kids are getting a little bit loud. My apologies. But, um, but it's like, what are we going to do with the, with the impact of those dollars that we have, you know? And right. uh, I think that's something that's important for us to recognize, you know, is that we have the ability. I mean, most of us are being rejected, not just by the police department, but we're being rejected by the banks. You know, it's like, think about how hard it is for African-Americans and for us to get jobs, even with our professional teams that we play for, you know, here it is that, like you said, you know, so many guys I know who have served on executive committees. I know guys who have played more than a decade, so many of our legends, organizations and yet here it is how are these guys that contributed to building up this league struggling so bad financially and why it is that we can't help them to uh you know to continue to to be empowered or employed by our league you know something that they help to contribute to build you know those are things that i look at to say like how can we come together now and actually start working together to make sure that we support one another during our careers and post-career yeah, yeah, and those some those some great points there, and especially when you hit on the, the economic impact that professional athletes as a whole, not just the NBA, but professional athletes, you know, as a whole, could have on on communities and 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 pooling resources and bringing strategic partnerships together to have an impact and you you know you 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 have to start somewhere and you have to be unified and that's where the strength is is being unified now let's move on to some basketball topics and you know i, I look at your career my career you know even though i played played years before you our careers kind of mirrored each other and um you know just like you, I, I, I spent some time involved with the uh, PA and was on the executive committee and the negotiating collective bargain agreements and everything. Looking at the current situation with, with the league having a work stoppage because of COVID-19 and now getting ready to resume play if, if they can line up. As as someone that sat in a in a in a seat at the table when you're negotiating collective bargain agreements and the, the things that go on in those boardrooms that iron out the details, what would some of the things that you would be concerned about if you were on the executive committee, Chris Paul's the, the, the president and LeBron and Steph, and, you know, he's got a tremendous executive, executive committee with him. But going back and playing, okay, it's fine. We understand the economics of the game. We understand you really want to crown a champion this game. What if? What if a player tests positive when they get back in Orlando? At, put yourself back in that seat. What would be some of the, the advice that you would give to the players that are getting ready to go back playing and what would be some of the, the, the pros and cons that you would say that, that actually pre-exists now that we've had a work stop because of a pandemic, something that's never happened in the NBA? Yeah. No, I mean, those are all fabulous points that you bring up. And for one, um, I want to just uh, 
you know, I, I don't envy uh, Chris Paul and envy the players being in the position, being forced to have to choose uh, to go back and continue to finish out the season. And to, obviously they, they feel the weight of uh, the pressure um, for everyone who, who loves and supports them. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't even envy Adam Silver and, 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 and their team, the NBA uh, side, for having to figure out how it is, how it is that you're going to compensate uh, season, season ticket holders who are paid in full for those uh, expensive seats and, uh, you know, and, and, and suites and all those different things. And now there is no, no season. So it's like there is no playoffs. Fans can't come participate. So a lot of businesses who are counting on, you know, taking their, um, you know, their, their employees, their, um, you know, counterparts or whomever, you know, to those games uh, throughout the playoffs or rooting for their, their teams. Like that, that's not even a possibility right now. And, you know, when you think about it, as you said, uh, for many of those players, it, uh, it's, it's hard. You, you talked about in the very beginning, you said the science. You can't, you can't ignore the science. The reality is there's people who have died from COVID-19. Um, in some places, even here in Houston, you know, I see protesters. I see people out and about. And it seems like in, in, the, in the, the area where I'm at, you know, we wear our masks and we say quarantine for the most part. And, it, and you don't know if it's actually real or not. And then you hear Rudy Gobert test positive. You hear uh, certain uh, members of the NBA who have recovered, but yet my memory isn't and doesn't fail me. It's like uh, we also have had some deaths um, that we've uh, incurred from just some of our NBA family. You know, Carl Anthony Towns, uh, uh, he lost his mother to COVID-19, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Right. And so for someone like that to be asked to go out and, and try to play, um, having lost a family member, someone close to them, uh, that you're not going to get back, it, it makes it very real. And I would like to just say that I think that, uh, you know, our health is bigger than, than this sport. It's bigger than the economic impact it's going to have. I know the NBA will re recover you out. If I was a player still playing, I'd be worried that they're going to leverage. And, and again, this is not to vilify the NBA or anything like that. It's just that I would be concerned that this is going to have a negative impact on player contracts going forward. And what I mean is that, you know, uh, contracts are derived off of salary cap. Salary cap has continued to rise because of the, the infusion of, you know, BRI and media rights and all these things. And, and now that this global impact has hit hard of COVID-19, that's going to impact who's able to, to buy those tickets. That's going to impact a lot of different uh, aspects of our game. And, uh, and that's also going to drive down that salary cap. And so now players who are max players coming into the 2022 and 2023 uh, seasons, it might not be as lucrative as what you thought it was going to be. So those are things to take in, into consideration. Yeah, and you, you, you touched on some, some important topics there. And one of the things that's going to impact the, the – NBA's BRI and, and basketball related income of, for, for the listeners that don't know what those, those stand for. And it goes back to when the season started, when the GM uh, for the Houston Rockets yep. made a derogatory comment about the, the Chinese market or the ch Chinese culture. And that impact is going to be felt after because when the Chinese market says we're not showing NBA games, that's a lot of revenue that's going to be missing. So like you said, Mo, and, you know, like you said, we both have been on the side of the negotiating table. We understand the mechanics of what drives NBA salaries, and it is that, that basketball-related income, the BRI, and the defined gross. Basketball, those certain things, those kickers that come from worldwide viewership, and for a lot of people, it's it's uh, you know, I've been I've been doing this podcast a few times, and it seemed like every time I get on the show, I either coach somebody or <laughs> been involved with somebody's career. That just means I'm old. <laughs> No, I had to, I, <laughs> I, I had the pleasure of coaching Mo with, with the Atlanta Hawks, and you know you talk about a hard hat glue guy coming to work every day, and you know consummate professional. And you know, Mo, our careers kind of mirror each other. We we didn't come into the 
NBA with an old whole bunch of confetti and ticker tape parades and stuff. We had to claw and fight for every inch and dollar we got. And just like you, I I suffered a ACL injury my second year with the Phoenix Suns, and I ended up playing in the Italian league for a portion of a season. And you played over in Greece and had some success over there. And then you came back to the NBA. Talk about the you know people. People see the ESPN highlights. All they see is the two three pointers a player made. They don't see that he was three for fifteen from the three point line. They see the glitz and the glam. And talk about your path, the struggle, the the, the fighting and the clawing and the the digging and that you have to do just to just to maintain that mentality. And you're overseas, you come back to the NBA, and then you talk about talk a little bit about the transition from when you when you finished as a player and what you've been doing in, in, in between time in that transition period, because I think it's so critical for people to hear what the path and the journey of, well, you know, we, uh, Michael, ba- Michael Jordan is the most famous, richest basketball player ever. They just did a 10 week documentary on him. I'm tired of hearing about Michael Jordan. He's the one percenter. Yeah, most certainly. That 85% of the guys, 90% of the players, they go through the paths that you and I had to go, go to camp every year, fighting against four guys trying to take your paycheck at your position until you can finally get that three, four year guaranteed contract. So talk a little bit about your journey and your transition after you finish playing. No, sure. And again, I just want to say, first and foremost, I applaud your efforts. uh, Because as you said, being a journeyman from one journeyman to another, I, I know how challenging and how much effort and sacrifice it takes to uh to continuously um persevere year in year out to earn those contracts and and i take my hat off to the top one percenters because that we you know we've all been blessed to play with you know the late great kobe bryant god rest his soul uh, joe johnson we had in atlanta um played with kevin garnett i mean just awesome players and uh and i know the work and the sacrifices they put in and they were really fortunate to be able to be compensated well and um and have a different trajectory and for me starting out you know i was again coming out of kansas i was all everything i was a two-time you know mr basketball i was a state champion i was highly decorated and recruited coming out of college out of high school and going into college and and even in college i had a great success i was leading the country in scoring as a sophomore um came out um projected top 15 pick and uh and it was at that point that everything went south everything that i thought i knew and the trajectory that i was on quickly changed because um you know I, again i ended up going undrafted so going from being projected to be a top 15 to going undrafted was not how i envisioned my career and i wish that they had had some of the things that we have in place now for players if they don't get drafted they can now go back to college and things of that nature but then it was if you if you leave you're you're and you say in the draft and it's, it's it's on you and the late great uh flip saunders who was my coach in um you know, Minnesota, um, you know, Detroit and, and Washington you used to have a saying is that there may be bad teams in the NBA, but there aren't many bad players. And and that's the truth, because all of those players that, that we played with and against, man, they're talented. They're all Mr. Something in somewhere. And so I, I had a again, I'm, I'm thankful that God allowed me to play 11 years. Nine of those seasons were in the NBA and two of them were in Europe. And I, I tried to do well to uh, to be impactful on every team but also tried to do well to, to make sure that I was uh, a steward, uh, stewarding the blessing that God gave me in terms of the money that I was able to make and empowering those around me, my family, my um, businesses, uh, my community, things of that nature. And that's kind of what I did to transition. After the ball stopped bouncing for me in 2012 and I retired in 2013, I had already invested in five businesses to that point. I've invested in seven more. Um, after that, and, and, and then I took the time to start investing in myself. And when I say investing in businesses, one thing that's challenging for me with our players, and you know, being a, an executive committee member, I didn't like this seeing that 60% of our players file bankruptcy within five years. And most of that's due to divorce. 
You right. know, you get to the end of your career, you get divorced. Now, all of a sudden, you're dividing up your assets. Your revenue stream has 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 now ceased. Now you're trying to reinvent yourself, and and that's just it's just, it's just a tall task for for any person to to be successful. And, and 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 you had to you will have had to make a lot of money to be able to sustain those different hits, especially the hit of a divorce. You know, and so a lot of um, our players are experiencing that. And so for me, um, I went through a lot, all of those different trajectories and by God's grace, I'm still standing, but I learned a lot and I grew in my business acumen and I grew in uh, my perseverance. I thought that I was going to be able to try to take the coaching path. I went to the NBA player program, did the top um, 100 program three times. I, you know, I thought I wanted to be a GM and you, and a lot of times when we're transitioning, we, 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 we gravitate to what we know and all I've known for the last you know, 20 years is really just basketball. Right. And, uh, and, and I'm thankful that I had enough people, you know, around me um, who taught me well. And again, I know that this doesn't, this name won't resonate in the same way for everybody. But one of the people who kind of took me under his wing was Billy Hunter, you know, while I was on his yep. committee, people think yep. that I took all these different perks and I was paid or that I did all these different things. All I did was try to do what was in the, the best interest of our players for what I understood at the time. So was I perfect? I wasn't. But did I ever do anything unintegral? I didn't. I, I, I just uh, tried to fight for our players. I tried to educate myself on the collecting bargaining process. I tried to represent our players well as I was elected by those individuals. And uh, and then I just pursued business opportunities when I got done. And um, and I've realized that my, my strengths are in the sports business sector, meaning uh, opportunities to monetize being an athlete, opportunities to monetize just the sports industry as a whole and uh whether that's products whether that's content whether that's events and so that's when i ended up starting my own company and it's called elos and the elos stands for every level of success and one reason i i intentionally named it use that acronym is because i wanted our players to i wanted something that would embody uh, a continuum of success i think that many of us players we reach success and we reach the pinnacle of our careers and our earning potential while we're in the nba and I don't think it should be just uh, should be so. I think that we should be able to sustain and create additional revenue opportunities once we leave the game because we all have a sphere of influence. We all have great accomplishments, regardless of whether you played one game or one year or, or 15 years, man, that's significant because there's not many people who get the opportunity to walk across those doors and come in those locker rooms and play in front of those fans and, and build and add to the to the equity and the brand of the NBA, and we've all done that. So I'm thankful for that, and I'm thankful to be a part of the National Basketball Retired Players Association. I'm thankful to, uh, you know, just to be able to support, and and um, I appreciate you guys having me on the podcast, too. Yeah, and I think you touched on some of the key elements that young players, they need to listen, you know, and, and, and that's one of the things that, you know, you find whether you're, the older guy on the team or you in the midst of having your family and raising kids and young people, I don't care what sector you're in, listen to your older people around you. And as a, as a player that transitioned from, from playing right into front office and then coaching and, you know, I've been blessed and, you know, but the biggest thing, uh, that I can tell young players is while you have that jersey on your back, that's going to be the most influence that you'll ever have. And a lot of the players get it backwards. You have to be proactive about your post career while you're playing. They don't understand. I don't care how many times you tell them, you know, and, and, you know, I played most of my career with, with, with the Charlotte Hornets, and I would tell the guys while we were in the locker room, I'm like, you better understand this thing. This is a meat locker. That hook in that locker for your jersey, it's, it's, it's a meat hook. When you can't play and produce anymore, you're going to be going out of here. So you need to do things while you're, you're still on an active roster. There is not a business in any NBA city if an active player calls and says, I think I might want to be an owner of a car dealership when I retire. Can I come in and do an eight week internship? And that's what I strive to tell people. If you thinking about a business you want to be in while you're playing, 
go to work. Go 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 learn the business that you you want to be in before you go dump a bunch of money into it. You know, and it's what I call the biggest mistake that a lot of former players make. They put their money into financing somebody else's dreams. Yep. And you know, it, it's a thin line that because a, a dream turns into a nightmare really quick. So, but uh. You know, Mo. I, like I said, I, I had the pleasure of coaching you, so I really know you and and, and know that you're a, a man of integrity. And you know, you, you put your hard head on, and you come to work every day. And uh, you know, it's been really insightful to listen to some of the points that you've made uh, for for a recently retired player and just the social consciousness that you 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 have. You know, when I came around. In the mid '80s, pro athletes didn't weigh in on political issues and religious issues and social injustice. And here you get whatever it was three or four years ago at the ESPYS, CP and D Wade and I think Carmelo and the whole the whole stage was full of those guys taking a stance on social injustices. So, you know, like I always say, our country isn't perfect, but it's getting there. We're 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 going in the right direction and it's going to take a few more skirmishes and battles, but uh, we're headed in the right direction. I think we all can, can, can look at that and feel good about it. Bridget, uh, have, has there been any questions that come in that uh, anything pointed towards Mo and me that we can address when we sign off? Yeah. So we did have a question come in, but it was about uh, comparisons between the lockout and what's going on now. And I think Mo talked about that um, well earlier, but um, why don't we do, let's switch it up a little bit, Mo. How about we go into the lightning round? I'm gonna ask you a couple rapid fire questions. You can just answer what the first thing comes to your mind. Sure. I'll, I'll preface it. I will not ask you who your favorite coach was. Oh, I don't know the answer to that. Flip. <laughs> um, so who either before your time or after your time do you wish could have been one of your teammates in the NBA? I mean, I would have loved to have the, the opportunity to play with Michael Jordan and win championships. You know, the man won six, six and eight years span. So I would say MJ. Mm-hmm. It's a popular answer. Um, what is the one win that is just like your most favorite win at any level of basketball play? I would say um, winning the championship in um, in Italy. You know, that was, you know, just winning that that championship was huge. I didn't get a chance to win the championship in the NBA, but winning that and just real quick, I want to go back. I, I would love to have played with LeBron. He's one of the most unselfish superstars in the game. I think that would have been really fun playing with him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so favorite win, the Italy championship. What is the one loss that you just like still, it still haunts you a little bit? That's easy for me. When we lost to uh, to Dwayne Wade and Shaquille O'Neal, and we, I was with the, the Detroit Pistons. We were 64 and 18. We were the best team in the NBA. And we, we just ran through everybody, and then we ended up, you know, losing – um, game six in, in, um, in you know, in uh, Miami, and uh, it just sucked, you know, and that ended our hope, and they went on and won the championship. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can feel it. I, I can feel your pain. Um, let's, feel, let's, let's, <laughs> let's think about back to traveling. So you're, you're on the team plane. You guys are traveling the country. Um, what was your favorite place to visit and play in? Um, my favorite place, believe it or not, was to play in was uh, New York. I love playing in the Garden, and then um, I'm gonna date date myself a little bit. I love playing in Arco Arena. That was like one of my favorite places because the fans were just always so uh, genuine and authentic, and you know that was just one of my my favorites. Okay, now on the other side of that coin, where didn't you like going to? You know what? I I never seem to have a good game in San Antonio. You know, and they, they got this chant that says, go Spurs, go. And, you know, before you know it, we'd be uh, hearing that dang chant. And that means that we it wasn't going our way that night. And uh, so San Antonio was one of the places. 
Okay. And then uh, last lightning round question for you. What's your favorite basketball movie? Um, I mean, loving basketball. I mean, I'm, I'm in that generation where loving basketball was, was um, you know, was definitely one of my favorites. But I'll have to go with even, again, the, the political climate. Glory Road was uh, another one of my favorites. I watch it with my son all the time. And just to see uh, UTEP, you know, break down a lot of those barriers, the racial barriers and climate and all those different actors, they, they, they really, um, you know, exemplified and told that story well. No, two great movies, but Glory Road, definitely, especially right now. And um, Travis Allen from Facebook, he chimed in with a question while I was doing the lightning round with you. And he's just wondering, who was your best teammate that you've played with? One, the best of offensive player teammate you had, and then the best defensive player teammate you had. Man, so... Um... You, you you know asking me those questions is funny it's like um you know i would have to say my overall favorite teammate of all time would be antonio mcdice just because he's just a, a awesome individual and a high character individual but you know in his prime he he could he could get it on both ends but when you talk about offensively obviously kobe bryant you, you know he was so gifted and talented and and he put us on his back so many times and um you know you got to give it up obviously he's no longer with us but loved playing with him and then from a defensive uh, standpoint, you know, I had a chance to play with uh, Dwight Howard in his prime, and he was a rim protector like, like no other when he was in his prime. I, I really enjoyed playing with him. You no, know, two, two really great players. Um, and that, that's it for the viewer questions. So, Kenny, do you have anything else for Mo? Well, pleasure getting the set to uh, chat with you, Mo. And as always, it's been a, a, a joy to uh, participate in this podcast with you. And I, I hope some of the, the listeners grasp some of the things you said because you made a lot of great points and touched on a lot of things that that are going to impact the NBA moving forward. You know, whatever they do to get this season back underway, but what's going to be the new normal that's what everybody will have to sit back and see because business sports as we know it everything's changed now so moving forward you know we're just gonna to have to wait and see so i appreciate you and uh, all the best to you and stay safe brother well, Gat, uh, bridget thank you so much for having me on and thank you for all the listeners who uh listen i apologize for my my technical difficulties in the beginning and uh wishing to all of our current players, um, you know, uh, safety and, and health and um, continued success as, as they finish out this uh, season. But um, thank you guys, and I wish you guys the, the best. Thank you. Thanks, Mo. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Kenny, that was another great conversation. You are just really killing it with these chats with Gat. Well, this is some of those things that is 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 so much to talk about. There's so much dialogue to be had, uh, and we get such a, a large variety of players, you know, in our podcast. You, you talking about the W players, the women, and their views, their paths, you know, and you you see that the similarities are almost identical. With with the men and the women, the court, the dimensions of the court is the same. So, the the issues, the problems, the the transition, all of the things that we we talk about and discuss, and I think that you know, what gives the the podcast and the, and the discussions some real teeth that we're talking about social issues that are are going to impact. Not only us, but our children, our uh, this whole country moving forward. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's always a pleasure to get on the Legends Live podcast, and you know, I'm here to help. And uh, looking forward to the next chat we got. Great, and I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit for a second because for all of our legends who are still watching right now. I really enjoyed this conversation because Mo ventured into the business realm and how he was a little bit different than some of his teammates where he was thinking about 
what he was going to do after playing while he was playing. And he said he finished playing and already was invested in five different companies. So I know that we as an organization at the MBRPA, we really want to help um, our legends with figuring out that transition. And especially if it's in the business side, the basketball side, whatever. And, um, you know, you being our vice president of player programming and membership, I just want to say, um, you know, for any legends out there who uh, want to have some of these conversations about the next steps and programs we offer in those spaces, reach out to Gat. <laughs> well, I'll be right here. Any questions you have, I certainly can answer them or I can find the answer. Yes. Um, well, Kenny, thank you again. And uh, for all of our viewers, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you would like to catch any of the previously recorded episodes, including today's between Kenny Gaddison and Mo Evans, you can go to legendsofbasketball.com slash legends live. And we're putting together a great lineup for you next week. Hope to see you back here Tuesday, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. And until then, as always, Stay well and take care of each other. And thank you so much for watching.